All right. Can you take one more night of me? You think you can handle one more night? I know you're anxious to get back to your pastor. And Brother Roster, thank you for allowing me to come. I tell you what, my cup has been full just to be a part of your first service. And the first week here has been such an immense blessing for me. And I thank God I've gained five pounds uh, I pride myself, and you forgive me, but you know, Paul said uh, physical exercise profiteth little, but I pride myself in trying to keep myself in some kind of shape. And uh, so I'm a treadmill runner. I figure if I run in the treadmill and I run in my garage, and if I run in my garage, I don't have to worry about cars, dogs, my church members laughing at me as I huff and puff down the road, stepping on curbs and other things. And, and so I have a date with a treadmill tomorrow about uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon to try to run out the 15 pounds that I've gained since I've been here, brother. Amen. And, uh, boy, you've, you have really met the tradition of eating you know, like Baptists do, and that's eat. We eat. Amen. And so I'm glad to have been able to spend the time with you. Yeah, and uh, I've enjoyed being with you. I know you're anxious uh, to, to uh, get back to your pastor and uh, to the business of the ministry here, brother. Uh, uh, and appreciate the ministry of Jehovah Jireh so much that I don't, our church would not qualify for anything from Jehovah Jireh, but I think it's such a wonderful ministry that I've invited my dear brother to come be with us uh, in March. I will. I fill out the paper when you get around to it uh, at, our, at our luncheon the other day. And so I think it's something good that every church ought to give to as a missions project. Just think if churches got on board with that, how many churches, brother, we could help. You've already done the work on that. And so we thank God for that ministry. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, if you will, please, tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And uh, we're going to look tonight and try to wrap it up uh, here. I hope that it, it's been a blessing to you. And uh, I'm sensitive to the time tonight. I really am understanding as a local church pastor that you're tired and then you got things going on tomorrow and uh, you want to be in the house of God and honor, honoring and obedient to the Lord, but yet uh, still you like to be home at, at a decent time and try to get some rest for tomorrow. And thank you for being faithful through the week and thank you for uh, honoring your pastor. And just let me say this to you, uh, you've got a great pastor. And uh, don't ever take, now you know a pastor sometimes can get in the pulpit and say it better than the pastor can of the church. And don't ever take your preacher for granted, amen. At any moment God could uh, take him away by death or God forbid some other way. Always appreciate him and his family. And uh, you do a good job of loving him. Thank you for all the food and all of the, the care and the house. And just it's all wonderful. And I just thank God for you folks tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I want to get right knee deep in it. I had a joke to tell you, but my last one last night went over so poorly that I figured I'd just get to the program tonight. Amen. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. Stand with me if you would, please. If you're able and honor to the Word of God, just seven verses. We are going to try to digest both, passage, both chapters tonight that deal with faith, faith, faith promise, missions, giving. But once again, I do have my eye on the clock. And so bear with us if you will, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do uh, you to wit of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desire Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you this same grace also. Verse 7, please. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. You see the word grace, by the way, in, uh, uh, in chapters 8 and 9, you find it used nine times in that passage of Scripture. You would find that it's really not a, a word that, uh, that you would think would fit with uh, when we talk about uh, giving, particularly in giving of finances and resources. But we find that Paul uses it, or the Holy Spirit uses it nine times in those two chapters. And we see it a lot in the first seven verses here that we read tonight. And uh, I'm a Bible numerology guy. I like num numbers in the Bible. And God's the perfect scientist. He's absolutely the perfect mathematician. And so I like when we see what Bible numbers mean, and I'm sure maybe your preacher's done some of that. The, the uh, number nine in the Bible means completeness or fullness. And it means the completeness or fullness of something that God intends to do. And so we see that in the process of faith, promise, missions, giving. Look at verse seven, please, tonight will be the text. We'll launch off here. Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance, knowledge and all diligence, what's the next statement? And your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. 
in this grace also. I want to preach you a message tonight, if you will, please, entitled this, The Grace of Faith, Promise, Missions, Giving. The Grace of Faith, Promise, Missions, Giving. You've heard it said that we're saved by grace through faith. Can I say this to you? We give by faith through grace. Amen. And I want to help you to see that tonight out of this passage. Father, we love you. Thank you for this good crowd tonight. Their faithfulness throughout the week. May, Lord, we do a good job to wrap up tonight, God, so that our hearts will be stirred, that we certainly, Father, will be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God leading us, Lord, now in the next few days as we make commitments to the 2015 Faith Promise Missions uh, budget of uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church. Help us, Lord, tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated if you would, please. We find in our text here, and you and I would know a lot about the background of this. If you've been in church very often, it's a very wordy couple of chapters of Scripture, but it really deals with the, a problem that persisted in the true church in Jerusalem. It was a problem of poverty that existed because of the hardship created because of their stand for Christ in a very orthodox Jewish culture. And so Paul, in our text today, Paul is really, as I believe, on his third missionary journey and he's collecting an offering for the poor and the persecuted church in Jerusalem. Paul was not able to come to the church in Corinth at this time. So in this letter that he writes, he sends instructions to them about how they are to give to meet the needs of others who are doing the work of God or, if you will please, to try to give back to that church to whom they felt uh, that Paul felt that they owed a debt to the Jerusalem church had been first and to give out the gospel as we talked about uh, here in the last couple of nights and uh, other, other churches in Asia Minor felt that they owed them a debt. I want you to take your Bible, please. We're going to look at two other passages tonight. Uh, Romans chapter number one, please. Would you turn back and just look there? And let me just give you the back course of what's going on here. And I'll, I'll take you to a couple of passages of scripture as we get into the meat and potatoes tonight of the message. Romans chapter number 15, please. And I want you to notice with me uh, verse number 25. Romans chapter 15 in verse number 25, Paul writes here and he says, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. Verse 26 of chapter 15, For it pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. And it hath pleased them verily in their debtors they are. Notice that once again. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of the, their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Verse 28, when therefore I have performed this and have sealed the, the, to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. He's talking to the, church, the, the, the Christians or the church in Rome. Turn back, please, if you will, to the text in 2 Corinthians tonight now. And so you and I understand thus far, in our, in, as we preach to you and tried to encourage you in the avenue of faith, promise, missions, giving, I've tried to help you to understand the recognition and the response and how you and I are to hear and allow God to speak to our hearts about how he would want us to commit by faith in the next year to supply missionary endeavors in the foreign field uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the substance that they would need. We've talked about the responsibilities, if you will, and the fact that, as we mentioned here in Romans 15, that we are debtors, we owe a debt to the God uh, that, uh, that gave us the gospel, Christ that sacrificed and paid for the gospel. We owe it to uh, the, those that have gone before us that communicated the gospel from faith to faith. We owe it to uh, uh, those that have not heard yet, those in the Philippines and in Germany and in the other missionary endeavors that you are currently involved in. And then, because I am confident that you're going to give more than what the preacher wants you to give tonight, uh, I'm going to challenge it even to reach higher than that goal. He's going, to, he's going to be willing and able this year because he's got more money and you're giving money to missions and I've already heard him promise every mission money dollar dime that comes in is going to go to a missionary. I by faith believe he's going to have to invite more missionaries in during the year to be able to support even more endeavors into the world. And so you and I have considered not only the recognition and the response and the responsibility or the debt. And then we talked last night about the resource, did we not? By faith, the water, if you will, please. And we equated that to you, what is a precious commodity to you and I today, and that's our finances. And so we find that, if you will, please, we see that now we see that God wants to give us a grace or an ability, if you will, to give and make a commitment, knowing all those things to be able to meet the needs 
of faith, promise, missions, giving. Notice number one, please, tonight, if you will. We see in the first five verses of chapter eight, we see the example of faith, promise, missions, giving. We find the mention of the Macedonian churches that Paul is using to provoke the church at, Cor at Corinth to do what they promised to do a year earlier. Notice what it says. Verse one, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. And you and I understand they're talking about the church, churches particularly at Philippi and the church, at, uh, the church in Berea and the church at Thessalonica and that northern part of Greece of that day. Early church, the early church considered the physical and financial giving to be a grace. Look at verse seven again, please. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and, and all diligence, he says, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. What is that grace? That's the grace of, of, of reaching out with their finances and meeting the needs of the poor saints in Jerusalem who are suffering and understanding their responsibility to communicate their love back to that church who had given so much to them and had brought in, if you will, please, the Savior, the Savior brought in that church. Can I say this to you tonight? Grace, in its essence, can be defined as many things. God's riches at Christ's expense, right? Grace, using the acronym, you've heard that before. Grace, God's unmerited favor towards men, undeserved favor that God bestows upon you and I. Can I give you just another definition tonight that I believe that will help you? Grace is simply this, it's the ability. It's God giving you and I the ability to demonstrate our love to Him by demonstrating our love to others. Let me say this to you tonight. We find that giving is truly a spiritual discipline. We find, if you will, we ought to read our Bibles, right? Amen? We ought to pray. That's things we ought to do. We ought to go, church, go to church regularly and faithfully. But let me say this to you. We cannot leave out that part of our Christian life which demands our heart, and that's reaching into our wallet and being obedient to Christ and the command to give our tithe. But not only that, God said to go above the tithe and to give an offering. God told the, the Israelites in Malachi chapter 3, he said, you've robbed God. They said, wherein have we robbed thee? And they said, in tithes and offerings. Why? Because a tithe shows your obedience to the Lord and offering shows your love for the Lord, if you will, please. We find if you, we see in verse number one there, the mention of the Macedonia churches as Paul makes example to the church in Corinth. Hey, and makes an example to you tonight. You could sit in the place of the church in Corinth and Paul could be writing this message to you, writing this lesson, lesson to you just as easily as he could, it was writing it to the church in Corinth in that day. We find the circumstances that they faced and we see their motives in verse two, it says here, how in the great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. In other words, it was, their liberality was the extreme giving under difficult circumstances or poverty that they had. We find they faced great affliction, if uh, you will please. We see that, the great persecution that they faced and we find the great purpose that they found and I'm gonna ask you to turn to another place. If you will look at Acts chapter 11 very quickly with me. Acts chapter uh, number uh, 11, if you will. And let me show you another portion where Paul is trying to draw their attention to as we uh, look tonight at the provoking of them trying, him trying to get them to give up their finances. Uh, uh, Acts chapter number 11, please. And I want you to drop down to verse 27, if you will, please, for me. Acts chapter 11 and verse number 27. The Bible says, in these days came prophets unto Jerusalem from Antioch. And that was in Syria. There stood up one of them named Agabus and signified the spirit by the spirit that there should be great dearth or famine throughout the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. And this was probably between AD 41 and 54, somewhere in there. The famine was in the late forties, we believe. And it says this, that uh, in verse 29, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And once again, we see the demonstration of a identification of someone in need of the gospel, in need of sustenance, that God used God's people. Hey, listen, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the gold and the wealth in every mind. God does not need your money. 
Everything he have, you have, he owns anyway. And he can direct it any way he will. But God wants your heart and your will. And thereby getting your heart and your will, he is able to use you and you are able to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ and be rooted and grounded in the faith. Why? Because God is using you because you need to be used. We find, if you will, please, tonight we find the great privilege they felt that they could give and the great poverty from out of which they funded. Turn, please, back to 2 Corinthians. We find the abundance of their liberality or their heart, but not of their resources. I like the fact that it says that they gave out of a great trial of affliction. Can I say something to you tonight? Satan does a very good job to get our mind on our troubles and distract us from the most important things, doesn't he? My friend, you could go to the doctor and get, and get a diagnosis of cancer tomorrow, and that would be a dominating thing. I think everybody would agree. But if we're not careful, we get our focus off of eternal things and get our, our focus on, on, on individual or temporal things, and we don't take care of the eternal things. Listen, they, in a great trial of their personal affliction in Macedonia, if you would read about the churches there and how they suffered, in spite of that, they kept an eternal perspective perspective and understood, listen, can I say this to you today, whether you live or die, whether you and I live or die, if we have another day upon the earth or not, the most important thing is that somebody knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Men live and die every day. My friend, Jesus Christ is in the saving business and people are going to continue to live and die. And you and I have a responsibility to continue to communicate the gospel. We see the method of their giving in verse three and four, and the power for their, by their, excuse me, for to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Verse four, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. You ever had anybody try to pay something for you and you really didn't want them to do that and you really tried to stop them from doing it, but they just actually forced you to take the money or take the pay the bill or whatever, the bought, bought the dinner or whatever, and you kind of felt a little bit awkward. You know, that's kind of what it was going on there. Paul understood the difficulty they faced, but he sensed, it, he sensed that, listen, they felt this was such a great grace and ability and opportunity to serve God that they almost forced the money on him. We find, by the way, that they were willing to give beyond their power. Hey, can I say this to you? God can do more with your sacrifice than you could ever do with what you have. We find, by the way, they gave themselves first. The Bible says in uh, verse number five, and this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave of their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Can I say this to you that, listen, God won't never be able to get what's in your wallet. And I realize preaching and talking about money is hard to do and it's always difficult because it's such a precious possession and we always have to weigh what we give, when we give it and where we have it and how we give it. But let me say this to you, if God can get to your heart, then he'll get to your wallet. He'll have your wallet already. If God can get to your heart today, then nothing you have will be considered as precious as your relationship to Jesus Christ. Can I say to you, Paul says this, that, that they consider their giving of fellowship and compel Paul in verse 4 as we read to take it. We find, by the way, Paul says that this grace which motiv motivated the Macedonians should be the same grace that would motivate the Corinthians, that would motivate Cornerstone Baptist Church in Spring Hill, Florida. Because you and I have received the word of God financed by others, we should have the same desire to get the gospel to the world by our witnessing and our wealth. Can I say we see the example, if you will, first and foremost in the first five verses, really a faith, mission, a faith promise missions giving. We see number two, please. And really verses six through 15, we see the exhortation to faith promise missions giving. We see the encouragement to do that. We find Paul exhorts the Corinthians to give, look at chapter verse six, please. In so much that we desire Titus, that as he had begun, so he would fin also finish in you this same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, we read it three times already, faith, others, knowledge, diligence, love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Verse eight, I speak not my commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to pr prove the sincerity of your love. Verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor, that through his poverty he might be made rich. We see that Paul exhorts the Corinthians in those verses. He commends them 
for all the good that they are doing, didn't he? They abounded in faith. They were able to witness. They had knowledge and diligence. They had all, they had love for Paul and, 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 and other apostles. Now he asked them to abound in their finances also. Boy, you got a beautiful building. Man, you got nice chairs. Man, you got a beautiful pulpit. Man, you got a nice property and room to grow. You got everything today. I mean, God has been good to the Cornerstone Baptist Church. Wouldn't it be a shame if you got so enamored with what you have here that you lose the reason that you're here anyway? Amen. And that's to reach out so that somebody else could be helped, that somebody else could be won, that another church could be started. Listen, in its good day, Cornerstone Baptist Church owes a debt to start another church somewhere else, to plant itself. Churches plant churches. And people get saved thereby. It's a byproduct of salvation. You get a bunch of people saved, you start a church. And then they grow and then you start another church. And that's what Paul was saying here. By, by the way, Paul's not commanding them to give, but exhorting them to give. Listen, nobody's commanding you to give tonight. Whether you take one of these or not, nobody's going to know but you and God. Whether you take one of these week, this week and pray about it or not, nobody's going to come to your house. Nobody's going to send you, you know, send the Catholic church. We're not going to send you a done in the mail and say, listen, you ain't showed up, but we'll still take your money. Now, I still do that, amen. I got people don't come, they send tithe checks, and I spend it just like every, every, the ones that are coming. But we find that Paul is not commanding them to give, and nobody's doing that. Paul was not commanding them. He was commending them. Why? Because they promised that they would, and they understood the spiritual implications. We find that he doesn't want them to give because they have to, but because they want to. Isn't that right, Brother Oster? Verse 8 says that again there. It says, listen, by occasion of the forwardness of others. He said, I don't do this by commandment to you. Chapter 9 and verse number 7 says this. You could flip over and look at it if you needed to. Every man, according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. You know, Paul gives two reasons by which he's asking them to give. The first is by occasion of the forwardness of others. What does that mean, preacher? Well, it was, this would be the example that the Macedonians had given. Hey, can I just say it's always easier to do something when you've seen somebody else do it. Listen, we used to be in the military, spent 12 years in the United States Army. Teach one, or see one, teach one, or I'm sorry, see one, do one, teach one. Is what the, you know, you see it done, and then you do it yourself, and then you teach somebody else how to do it. And he said, listen, by the forwardness of others, I want you to look at the church at Macedonia, what they've done. And it ought to make you jealous. <laughs> it ought to make you want to do what they're doing. And then he gave the second example, the second reason. He said, by the prove the sincerity of your love. You know, can I say this? That you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. You ever heard that before? We find that, in other words, put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> you know, we can tell people we love them all day long. My grandmother used to say this. The only grandparent I ever had lived to be 102 years old. Helped raise me in my life. She said this, don't tell me you love me. Show me you love me. We tell God we love Him a lot, don't we? But I'm afraid the show sometimes comes up a little short, doesn't it? Let me say, Paul asked them to remember the supreme example. And by the way, if you can't do it for any other reason, verse number 9 should be a neon light in your life. Jesus Christ gave Himself and became poor. He that was rich owned all, all of heaven and earth and everything besides, humbled Himself and became obedient, even to the death of the cross, given a sacrifice of His life. So that you and I could identify with him. May I say Paul exhorts them, by the way, to keep their promises, verses 10 through 15. Look at it. We're kind of plowing through here, aren't we? And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, he says, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be a forward. Watch what it says, a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that is there not a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. He said, for if there uh, be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath and not according that he hath not. For I mean not that, that uh, other men be eased and ye burden, but by equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. Verse 15, as it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over and he that hath gathered had no lack. May I say this to you? The Corinthians made a promise a year earlier. A year earlier. 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. Let me read what it says to you in the first couple of verses there. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, 
Even so do ye, he reminds the Corinthian church, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay up by, by him and storeth God that's prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. He says, when I come by to pick up that offering that you promised a, a year ago, have it ready because I need to get down to Jerusalem for the, pen, for the feast of the Passover uh, and, and to celebrate that. So be ready to go. That's not necessarily in the tithe, although I use it often for the tithe in the first day of the week, if you will, please. It says, and, I, and when I come, it says, whosoever you shall prove by your letters, then will I send to bring your money, your finances, your liberality that he talked about in the later letter unto Jerusalem. We find, by the way, that we see that they promised to give something to the poor saints in Jerusalem. Any promise that a Christian makes is between them and the Lord. Did you really know that? I can't keep up with your promise and I don't want to. I got enough promises that I'm trying. God says, don't vow a vow to the Lord and fail to repay it. But my friend, you come down to an old-fashioned altar, you make a promise to the Lord, or you fill out a commitment, you drop it in an offering plate, you need to understand that God does not take lightly your willingness and your promise and commitment unto Him. You know, this raises an issue of making a pledge to give a certain amount of money. You know, sometimes people struggle a little bit with that. Some people say they don't think a Christian should make a pledge and but let me say this to you. I think that you and I need to recognize that in the world in which we live, we sign pledges for everything else. Don't we? Listen, we, we, I think that people ought to be, make, be willing to make a, make a pledge to God's work. You know, we promise to pay our rent. We sign notes when we buy an automobile or a refrigerator. You know, we sign on those, if you will, please. I say that you and I can sign on the dotted line for God's work too. I do. And my friend, this will come before any car payment, I promise you. This will come before any house payment or any other payment I got other than my tithe. Can I say this to you? We find in verse number 12, Paul exhorts them to give of a willing mind. Hey, a willing mind is a sacrificial mind. It considers what one has to give and not, not, not uh, what one will have left after giving. In verse 13, Paul exhorts each Christian to do their part. Look at what it says again, please. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burden. Hey, listen, but God doesn't intend for the whole other world to be burdened with, the, with worldwide missions and you to be eased. Right? You and I need to do our part together. Victory Baptist Church in Cocoa doing its part. Cornerstone Baptist Church in Spring Hill doing its part. Faith Baptist Church in Wesley Chapel doing its part. And each local New Testament body of believers understanding the responsibility that they have in worldwide missions and the sacrifice that God wants them to make in providing the finances that are needed, each one sharing their piece of the pie. And I say to you, we find that verse 14, Paul exhorts that there be an equality among God's people that those, watch, who have an abundance should help supply the need of those that lack. Look at that verse. It's kind of wordy, isn't it? Look what it says there. But by inequality, that now at this time, your abundance may, he says the Corinthian church had a little extra. So your abundance may be a supply for their, those people who want or, or have wants. And that their abundance may, may be a supply for your want. Why? Because you get spiritual things. It's like your preacher tonight, right? Listen, I just can tell you, I love your preacher. He loves to eat like me. <laughs> Amen. How many of you enjoy the Bible teaching you get from this pulpit from that man? Raise your hand. You enjoy the Bible teaching. I mean, it is excellent. But let me tell you, just as much as you enjoy the spiritual hamburgers that you're eating, he enjoys the physical hamburgers that he likes to eat. Amen. <laughs> so guess what? It's a good buy-off, isn't it? He gives to you spiritual food and and you give back to him the resources and the means to provide for he and his family and enjoy some things that he likes. I'm jealous of his coffee maker in his office. I'm <laughs> lustful, let me say, I'm lustful for many things in this ministry. And so it's, it's good that I'm leaving tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> we find, by the way, that in verse 15, Paul uses the example of the gathering of manna in the wilderness in Exodus 16. That's what the reference is there for, it says. It says that each was to gather enough for one day. You remember that, don't you? Some would go and out and greedily gather up much more than he needed. And after he'd eaten what he needed for that day, he would, he would tore it up and then he would find the rest had spoiled by the next morning. It was God's plan that each one should have just enough and no more. And by the way, God's not against you having some things. But my friend, what's the point in you having a ton 
and, it, and, and you're leaving it to somebody or somewhere else that all they're going to do is spend it on themselves and it doesn't go to help any, any cause of Christ, if you will, at all. Listen, the Bible says this in Acts chapter number 4 and verse 32. And for time's sake tonight, let me read it for you. As you certainly can make a note in your Bible there or on your paper and then turn or if you'd like to. And the multitude of them that believed, and this is the early church there in Acts, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. I wonder if, the, I wonder if Cornerstone Baptist Church tonight is of one heart and one soul. In this area of giving to worldwide missions, it says this, Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And the, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because that was the focus. And great grace, God says, was upon them all. The grace to give. The grace to tell about Christ. Why? Because they were fully engaged in the gospel, personally. It says here, Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of those things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. But in a couple of verses, you see a story by, about a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira who did not share that same philosophy of giving. Back in Corinthians, we find ourselves, if you will, please, there's a story told years ago of a pastor who was sitting excuse me, visiting India and uh, during a harvest festival. And he told of an elderly widow who brought a very large offering of rice, a great deal more than she could offer, could afford to give. And the visiting pastor confirmed with the leaders of the church that she was impoverished. And he asked her about the meaning of the offering. And she says this, my son was sick and I promised a large gift to God if he got well. And the, the preacher asked, and your son recovered? No, she said, he died last week but I know that he's in God's care and for that I am especially thankful so I want to give accordingly to my heart. God help us today to have a heart to see the lost and dying in our, about us but in our worlds. Hey, let me ask you a question. Do you ever pull up to the stoplight next to somebody in Spring Hill and look over to them and ask yourself, I wonder if that person knows Christ. I wonder if that person's going to heaven when they die. Can I give you this? We've talked number one tonight about the example of faith promised missions giving, that example was the churches of Macedonia, wasn't it? And Paul was trying to provoke the Corinthian church. I want you to look at them. We saw the exhortation to give and some different things there. But number three, please, very quickly, we see an expectation of faith promised missions giving in, in, in the last several verses here in chapter number eight. Paul sent Titus and some trusted companions to get the offering in verses 16 and 17 and I'm not going to beleaguer you with all the passage tonight, although it's important, but thanks be to God, verse 16, that put the same earnest care in the heart of Titus for you. For indeed he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. And we have sent him uh, with, with the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches, that, and not, the, the, uh, not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us. Watch, with this grace, which is determined by us to the glory of the same Lord the, 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 to, and the declaration of your ready mind. In other words, what he was saying this, I'm going to send Titus and some good companions up to get the offering. And just so you can have some comfort, I'm going to send more than one so you won't think that Titus is going to run off with what you're sending. By the way, can I say this to you? The expectation of faith promised missions given, Brother Rossler uh, absolutely shares it right. Every dime of missions giving should go out to missionaries. And by the way, there should be an accountability. And your preacher and, and whoever he provides for oversight of that, make sure that whoever you're investing that money, you can trust that they are trying to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, listen, if, if you take Brother Javier on, uh, listen, he has to be an accountable to this ministry that whatever money you're giving him on a monthly or an annually basis, that he's investing that money in a manner which is consistent with the biblical principles of worldwide missions which would be for his personal upkeep and his desire so that he could do what's necessary to get outside the doors of his hut, not hut in Palawan, huh? House, wherever it is, and reach people with the gospel. My, Titus wanted as, uh, as much as Paul to take it up, up an offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem. He shared Paul's heart. By the way, I share your heart tonight, brother. I share your heart, and I'm sure many tonight share our hearts in the matter of, of, of faith promise missions. Paul established safeguards, as we see here, to ensure the money was administered as promised. And Paul concludes this portion by asking for a proof of their love. Drop down to verse 24. 
I am going to go into chapter 9, but I need to get there. It says, Wherefore, show ye to them, and before the churches, the proof of your love, and of your boasting, our boasting on your behalf. We find Paul called the gift of bounty, if you will please, in the verse there preceding. That indicates that it would be a generous gift, which is the evidence of the grace of God working in the heart. Can I say a bounty of a gift is not measured about how much you give? Do, do you believe that the widow's might in the, in, in the Gospels was a bounty? And why was it a bounty? It was all she had. She, it wasn't the amount that mattered, right? It was the sacrifice that she made that mattered. Why? Because God can take the might and make it a million, right? He can break the bread and feed 5,000, is that right? And so you and I understand the measure. Listen to what it says here. The measure of Christ's importance to us is the extent to which we will go to make him known to others. Can I give you the last point tonight? My great desire is to be done by 8.30, amen? And it looks like we're on track unless you stop saying amen. <laughs> we find not only number one, please, tonight as we talk about the, the grace by faith of faith promised missions or the grace of faith promised missions giving. Number one, the example. We saw the example. We had a good, we've got a good example here in the Bible, don't we? We find, number two, the exhortation to, to, to faith promise and the encouragement Paul was trying to give to that church at Corinth by comparing and magnifying them against that church there, in Mas the churches in Macedonia. We saw the expectation that there should be an accountability, right? We just don't give and then hope that it goes where it's supposed to go, right? I'm going to be honest with you, Brother, Brother Rosser, Pastor Ross, if I'm sitting in the pew here and I'm a member of your church and I ain't heard from your missionary or you ain't told me anything about your missionary, I can't find a missions letter on the board in six months. I'm just going to be one of those ornery guys and say, hey, have you heard from Brother Javier lately? Is he dead or is he, what's he doing over there? Or is he sitting on the beach drinking margaritas and uh, being fanned by leaves? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty cool place that I saw there, right? A beautiful place you're going to, right? I want to know that he's taking what little bit I got, which is a sacrifice of my life, right? Can I say the encouragement to faith promised missions giving in chapter 9? We see the Corinthians had promised and committed to give. Look at the first five verses here. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write unto you, or it's, uh, it's excessive, if you will. Paul says, For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast to you of them of Macedonia and Achaia. I was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. He said, Listen, you promised a year ago, and guess what I did? I went to Macedonia and told them about you. Now I'm back down here telling, telling you about them. Because both of you said, "Whoa, we're ready to give. We find it says there in verse number three, Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain. In this behalf, as I said, that ye may be ready. He said, listen, I'm sending some people down to Macedonia, from Macedonia to see you, and they're going to be expecting to take up an offering. If they don't, they're going to think bad of both you and me. Look what it says in verse four, Lest happily if they have Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared. We that we say, not ye, should be ashamed in the same confident bragging or boasting, if you will. Paul used them to provoke the Macedonian churches to give a year prior. Remember when they made the promise, we're going to give. Paul said, I'll be back in a year to get it. They didn't, you know, they didn't, have, uh, they didn't have cars and you know, planes and buses and that type of thing. And so he said, I'll be back in a year. I'm going to go get some more money. And I went to Macedonia and I told them, listen, I'm coming back through Corinth on my way to Jerusalem and I'm going to take up their offering and I'll bring yours with us. And you send Titus with, with, I'll send Titus and some others and they'll watch over and make sure that uh, they don't spend it on uh, margaritas and whatever. We find when Paul was talking to the Ephesian elders, he reminded them of the same thing. I've showed unto you all things how so, that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it's more blessed to give than receive. You know God's economy of giving, don't you? You give to get to give, Right? You get and you keep what you need to supply and you give and then you hold your hands up again and God gives more. But my friend, if you keep your hands in your pockets too long, that's what God does. He stops giving from here. Why? Because we break God's economy of giving. Listen, Kim, I say this to him having a missions conference in March. That's when I have mine in March of 2015. And I hope that I can talk, I hope that I can talk about you in March. I'm going to be looking, brother. I want a phone call, a text, your commitment. I'm going to be disappointed if it's not uh, the, the goal. We want it to be the goal. I'm going to thank God for whatever comes in and rejoice and pray that that's what God ordained and we'll thank God for that. But listen, let me tell you what I'm going to do when I stand in front of my church. 
I'm going to say Cornerstone Baptist Church in Spring Hill. I was honored to preach their mission conference back in March and they, or November, and they gave this much. You're not going to let them out give you, I know. Hallelujah. I'm going to use you just like, I'm going to use you and I'm going to abuse you in March. You better double dog believe I'm going to do it. Amen. You're not going to let Cornerstone back. I know you're not going to do that. Yes. They gave 40000 to you. You're surely not going to get less than that. If you do, I'm going to make fun of you. <laughs> Nobody likes to be made fun of. Amen. Let me get my wallet out. I don't be made fun of. Hey, can I say to you today, we find that the Corinthians were to be an encouragement by fulfilling the promise to give. Look at verse 6 and 7. Let's don't skip verse 5. It's too important. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand the, your bounty. Where have you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness? But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Hey, can I say what you feel right down in your heart is what you ought to give. Listen, but here's the test. God says, but I don't want you to give it if you're going to do it grudgingly. If every time you get ready to write a check, it's a frustration for you. God says he doesn't want your service for him being grievous to your heart. Amen. God doesn't want anything, any grudge giving or grudging giving. Well, what does that mean? God does not want one penny from you if you would rather keep it for yourself. Why? Because that's with the wrong heart. Not only does it say God doesn't want you to give if you give grudgingly, neither does He want you to give of necessity or because you feel like you have to. I hope tonight that I don't walk away from here and you go home in the next couple of days, you feel like that you have to because you feel some burden or pressure from me or the ministry for you to give the missions. I hope that you consider it a great privilege to invest in the, assess, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the reaching of souls for Christ and not because I got to. If I, if I don't, then somebody will find out. Oh, my friend, I hope that's not your heart tonight. I hope that you understand the great burden that, that the Worldwide Missions proclaims upon all of us. God loveth, the Bible says in verse 7, uh, seven a cheerful giver. And that should be the happiest part of our service. Why? The Bible says... Help me out where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is that right? Can I say to you tonight, we see that the promise of missions is God's way of giving to the world. Verses 8 and 10, please. God is able to make all grace abound, verse 8, towards you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. In other words, God says, if you're really going to get blessed in what you're doing, you better make sure your finances are in the right place. It says in verse 9, as is written, He hath dispersed abroad, he given to the poor his righteousness, remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Hey, listen, we find God's going to give you enough for others and for you. Hallelujah. That's what it says in that verse. He's going to give you enough to give to others and give you what you need. What a great God we have. Amen. Not going to let you do it out. God's not going to be a debtor to you. Watch. Paul gives the illustration of the farmer. Look at verse 11. It says here, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness. In verse 10, we read about the farmer, which calls it through us thanksgiving to God. What does that mean? Well, he says this. He doesn't, he doesn't mind, uh, the farmer doesn't mind going out to scatter a bushel after bushel of seed because he believes that he will get an abundant harvest. It's God who multiplies the seed of the farmer. Remember the rain from last night. They gave all the rain that they had, all the water that they had, and God looked at them and said, they'll die if they don't get some water. And then the, the prophet said, go and look, and if you see any rain clouds, he said, well, I see something, a little black cloud way out there. I ain't really sure. It's not a bug way out there that I see that looks like a cloud. Elijah told him this, go tell Ahab to prepare himself, lest he get stuck in the mud going back to his place and his chariot because it's going to rain. Why? Because Ahab needed rain? No. Because God's people were involved in giving their resource and God gave back to them more abundantly than they gave. Why? Because he's not going to be a debtor. And my friend, they gave by faith. Can I say to you tonight, you give to others and God gives back to you. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, running over, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. Why? For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Finally tonight, in the last couple of verses, 
We see the project of, of faith, promise, missions given. And can I tell you, please don't miss this. If you don't get anything else, don't miss this. This is a pure, true blessing and reason to give. Look at verses 11 through 15. Let's finish the chapter strong. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Did you see that phrase? Thanksgiving to God for the administration of this service. Not only supplied the one of the saints in the Philippines, that's the HIV version once again that's in there, the Hall-inspired version, that'll get you in trouble every time, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. See that again? Watch. Whilst by the experiment of His ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection to the gospel of Christ. In other words, your submission to give and for your liberal distribu distribution unto them and to all men and by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Watch, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Watch, you see, when you give, it says, it will cause people to thank God for you. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Amen. Hey, listen, it is God who will get the praise and the glory can I tell you, the Filipinos don't know Cornerstone Baptist Church from a hole in the wall. But my friend, when that person comes in and gets saved and Brother Javier sits down and he's teaching in his services and he said, I want you to understand that I'm able to be here today and you need to commit to give the faith promise missions giving because we got a missionary going to Taiwan. But I want you to understand there's 25, 30, there's 50 churches back in the United States that are supporting me so I can be here to preach the gospel to you. And, uh, and, and they've given so that, we, that I can be here. And although you don't know them, they have been faithful year in and year out. You know what they're going to say? They're not going to say, thank God for Cornerstone Baptist Church. Now they may say, thank God for the churches in America that care enough about us to support our, our preacher for missions. But let me tell you what ultimately they're going to do. They're going to do exactly what God intended for you and I to do with our finances. They're going to look up to God and they're going to say, thank God for those churches in America that care. Amen. 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 And my friend, you and I are not going to get the glory for it. We're not going to be able to walk around with our chest pumped out. Right. Man, I got some people saved over in the Philippines. <laughs> My $5 a month doing this work. They're not going to do that. They're going to say, when they understand, thank God for those people. We see the administration of the service, verses 13 through 15. We read it, it says this. Supplies the needs of the saints. That's God's economics. Here, people get saved because you're faithful. Makes others thankful for, for and praise God for you. And give me, let me tell you what it also does. Missionaries get encouraged. And guess what? Brother Javier and others send missionaries to Taiwan out of the Philippines. <laughs> and he says, you know, they're supporting me. Maybe it'll come a day when Brother Javier is self-supporting. And he can write back to Cornerstone Baptist Church and say, thank you for the X years that you've supported me. Please take your mission money and send it somewhere else. We are self-sustaining and self-supporting so much so now that they're not only taking care of me as their pastor, but they're reaching out to the world around them. Hey, won't it be a wonderful day when, when Brother Javier sends a missionary out of his church to the United States of America? Amen. The third largest mission field in the world. Listen, we give because God calls us to. Right? Speak, Lord, for thy servant here. Hey, we give because we owe a debt. I am debtor. God compels us to do so. We give because we have an abundance in our land. Hey, we're the Corinthians of our day. A, a seaport that was, that, that was a well-orchestrated machine and brought in finances. The church had money. It had more money than they did in Jerusalem. We give because Christ gave to us. Hey, we give because people will die and go to hell if we don't. Hey, we give because God will get the glory on both ends if we do. The Filipino man looks up and says, thank God for the churches in America. We get the report from him and we say, thank God for the people in the Philippines getting saved. And both of us on different parts of the earth are looking to God and saying, thank God. <laughs> And the Lord's receiving all the glory due to His name. You and I are saved by grace through faith. But we also give the same way. 
Let me ask you, will you allow the grace of God to work through you to give you the grace or give by grace through faith and faith promised missions given this week? Hey, for this reason, that all may hear. Amen. Stand to your feet. Father, thank you tonight. These have been a very gracious and a very easy people to preach to through this week. And I pray that you would take, God, the messages that have been given and that, God, you would help each one build upon another one to the point tonight where we've kind of wrapped it all together. We've examined, God, a lot of Scripture in a short time. We have looked at and saw some examples and exhortations and some expectations, Lord, there to make sure that it was taken care of the way that it should have been. And, God, we've seen how you would be glorified through it all. And Father, may you work in the individual heart in this room tonight to help them to see their responsibility and the debt they owe. And then, God, would you take that individual in that pew, and Lord, as you work in his heart, would you take the guy beside him and the lady behind him and the, uh, Lord, the couple in front of him, God, who'll be praying this week, and would you put all that together and would you make it, Lord, $36,000? Would you make it more? And Father, if you do, God, and foresee truly and purely, God, faith promised missions as you presented it, it, Father, will do its work and you'll be glorified not only by, God, this church through the ages and days to come, but, Father, as they plant churches and as that Filipino, that German, that other person saved, God, they'll look up and they'll say, thank God for that church that sent money to help my preacher to win me to Christ. And, Father, that'll be truly the culmination of it all. We'll thank you for it. You had your bow, your eyes are closed. Come on, Brother Ross.